Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thanks to everyone who's um, hung around through the bitter end of this conference to hear this talk. I appreciate it. Um, after Lewis's introduction, it struck me maybe I should just um, improvise uh, an hour-long talk on critical theory. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't. Um, I do want to begin by saying that the relationship between ESNet and Scenic is critically important, and we regard it as truly strategic. Scenic is such an important institution in California, it, it makes a major contribution to the um, culture of innovation that we enjoy so much in California, and indeed to the economy of innovation. And I, as I'll try to explain in the course of this talk, um, the relationship between ESNet and Scenic is already critically important to the process of scientific discovery throughout the state, and it will grow more so over time. Um, and so I look forward to um, a long and fruitful collaboration going forward with Scenic. Um, and I want to I want to begin um, uh, in solidarity with Michael Sinatra and the extraordinary performance he gave a couple of days ago. I've decided to do this talk um, without any slides whatsoever. <laughs> Is Michael here? Did he wake up for this talk? OK. He may be roasted occasionally. God knows he roasts. Um, actually, I will have slides for the talk. And the first one is in honor of a friend and mentor of mine, a person I enjoy so much, Mr. Ken Lindahl. Um, I w I'm very sorry not to have attended the first part of this conference. I was hermetically sealed in uh, an old school style strategy retreat at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab where I work as a division director. Um, there was no email, no web, no texting, and it did have the effect of making us talk to each other in a constructive way, but I, as a result I missed the first part of the um, of the conference. But I really, I really especially regret missing um, the treat of seeing Ken accept his award. Many people in the networking community build networking standards, and some of them implement standards. But what Ken has done throughout his entire career uh, at Berkeley and in the state is to raise standards for everyone. Um, and he's, he's done that so elegantly, um, compassionately. He's, um, I consider him a friend and a mentor. And I greatly admire his sense of style and everything he does, the way he collaborates, the way he dresses, uh, <laughs> the way he capitalizes or not his name. <laughs> I'm a big fan, and, and I, I, Ken, I don't know if you're here, but um, I would say you are deeply appreciated. So this is a well-deserved honor. OK. Oh, you're welcome. There you are. Good. Good. It's a treat to see you here. OK, so on, on to the talk. And there's really just three main sections to this. I want to um, tell you a little bit about the Energy Sciences Network. You may know something about it, and I'll fill out that knowledge for those of you who don't. Um, it's, it's another big network in California. Um, I want to talk a bit about a way of thinking about networks that I'm finding useful as I chart a path for ESNet in the next three to five years. Network, I call it Network as Instrument. And then I want to um, focus on some things we can do together to make data and therefore discovery move faster in California. So we'll start with an overview of the Energy Sciences Network. Um, this is now a 26-year-old mission network in support of the Department of Energy's Office of Science. You know, when putting this slide together, I realized it may be the last time I get to use the Steve Chu Obama picture. So we have a new um, nominee uh, designated for the Department of Energy, Secretary of Department of Energy, Ernie Moniz, another um, physicist, PhD physicist, and another expert in energy policy and energy technology. Um, it, the Office of Science is um, a, an enormous funding organization. It's probably the largest in the country that no one has ever heard of, uh, certainly my Parents had never heard of it, and I don't think I had heard of it before coming to LBNL. It, um, though, makes grants of about $5 billion a year, primarily in the physical sciences, but more and more in the biological sciences, in material sciences, and um, in, in many basics, other basic sciences. But um, what distinguishes it from the NSF is that it funds very large, um, in, very large instruments which are called in the vocabulary of DOE user facilities. And these are things that are really too big for a university to own, to own and operate. And in fact, that's the origin of the Department of Energy when um, E.O. Lawrence's cyclotron on the Berkeley campus just became too much of a hassle for Berkeley to manage it. It moved uphill into a new institution. And currently, the DOE 
um, funds and manages over 30 uh, user facilities. These are major supercomputers, accelerators, light sources, so sources of very bright, intense um, uh, neutron beams or, or photon beams, um, electron microscope sequencers. And in fact, the Energy Sciences Network is considered to be a user facility um, in, within this family of user facilities. The uh, mission of the Energy Sciences Network is really inherited directly from that of the Office of Science. We just aim to accelerate research and discovery uh, for, for the missions of DOE. Now, I, t I talked about these user facilities. These are not DOE user facilities. They're managed by DOE, but they're really our user facilities. They're national user facilities. They're for um, university researchers and scientists all around the country. And there's a lot of them in California, twice as many in California as in any other state. And actually, if you include not just the user facilities, but the institutes and the centers that are also funded by DOE, and they're doing remarkable work in biofuels and artificial photosynthesis and a number of other um, critically important scientific domains, California has far more um, than any other state. Many of them are clustered in the Bay Area, although General Atomics is down here very, very close to us. Um, because most of the users at these user facilities actually come from universities, um, and many of them come from California universities, um, uh, you can, and, and, and the user facilities themselves generate so much data that needs to be consumed by the universities, um, you can see why the relationship between Scenic and ESNet is critically important. Just a quick overview on the network. We are a national scale network. We connect 40 national laboratories, facilities, or sites um, and we interconnect them to 100 other networks around the world. We are really optimized for massive science data flows. I'll talk about that in a second, but we're really not optimized for, um, for sort of ordinary commodity internet traffic. Um, we increasingly offer capabilities that are, that are um, customized for the needs of our scientific users that are not available commercially. Um, we're about a $35 million organization, about 40 staff. We're, we're actually st a little bit lean right now. We do need to grow somewhat um, given our, our scope, our mission. So we'll be doing that in the next year. Um, we were very, very fortunate uh, a few years ago to receive a large influx of stimulus funds. Um, um, of course, many public networks receive the benefit of stimulus funds. What we did with ours was partner with Internet2 to invest in a nationwide optical footprint that enabled us to make the most important technology transition in our history. So we did something that other networks had already done, including Scenic, which is to move to an optical infrastructure to have direct access to spectrum. Um, we were able to build the world's first continental scale 100 gigabit network and light it and move it into production last fall. Michael actually played an integral role in that process. Um, and it's now easier and much cheaper for us to scale up in response to the demands of our uh, scientific user facilities. Um, I, will, I would like to call attention to a few websites. We have www.es.net, obviously, but we're very proud of a couple of others. Fasterdata.es.net, which is a kind of um, community knowledge base for moving data fast. And it receives twice as many hits as our, our core website. We got 200,000 page views last year. MyES.net is, is a place where we build tools to let users um, and scientists inspect the network. So we're embedded in a US national laboratory at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. That makes a lot of difference. So this is where our office is on the hillside above UC Berkeley. We're one of three divisions or sort of chunks of, of the lab um, within the computing sciences directorate. So the other one is two others are a division of applied mathematicians and then a supercomputing facility. And we are, we are literally, literally surrounded by scientific collaborations, by large-scale tools, the user facilities I mentioned, by petabytes of data. And this um, deeply affects our culture because we have constant hallway conversations, uh, um, cafeteria conversations with scientists. And so we're really steeped in, in the sort of productive scientific culture of LBNL. But we're also UC employees. We're coupled to UC Berkeley. We're just uphill. And um, hundreds of lab scientists actually have joint appointments on campus. And in fact, we're working, and Michael's part of this as well, to extend our collaborative efforts with UC Berkeley. We have not taken advantage of that, um, either with IST or with EECS on campus. And so we aim to do that more in the future. We have a terrific ad advisory board. Um, you'll recognize Larry Smarr on the left. Um, and you may recognize a few other people, including Vince Cerf. It, it's a great honor to. Um, 
to, to um, have the benefit of the wisdom of these folks. Uh, and when they meet to discuss the future of TCP, as they did um, about a year ago at LBNL, it's very entertaining. Um, those of you who are network engineers will understand this, but for those who may not be, I'll, I'll say a little bit about the nature of our data flows. Um, we sometimes make a distinction between elephant flows and mouse flows. And the, you know, the flows that you generate at home on YouTube or Hulu, they may seem big to you. They may sort of clog up your local wireless access point, but they're quite small compared to the massive science data flows that we build our network um, around um, and, and optimize it for. So the mouse flows, there may be 100 million of them in, in the internet core. They average out into these nice, smooth, diurnal patterns just that are correlated with when people are awake and when they're asleep. The elephant flows are much more bumpy. In our network core, a single job firing up or a single workflow kicking off can, can increase the network utilization of the core by 30%. And, and that will happen abruptly without any warning, and then it will shut off again. And, and so we get a, a much bumpier, less deterministic, non-diurnal pattern in our core. Um, now, the elephants are surprisingly sensitive, um, especially if the elephants are related to long RTT, high bandwidth flows with a lot of latency. A tiny, tiny, tiny bit of packet loss can just blow away TC throughput, TCP throughput just because of the dynamics of TCP. And we did a little measurement recently when we found um, a component that was dropping packets at a very low but consistent rate in the network. So 0.0046% packet loss, one out of 22,000, um, at sufficient latencies and sufficiently high throughputs um, absolutely destroys um, our ability to move data. It may reduce throughput by 50 to 80 times. Um, and so as a result, we need to engineer to the extent possible for a lossless core. Um, and it's difficult to do it, in, in, it involves, there's a little recipe book for how to do it to the left, I won't go through that, but it involves a lot of engineering and, and operational care. We spend a lot of time thinking about um, engineering for the elephant flows. And the elephant flows are creating an almost um, insatiable demand for bandwidth. We have this, um, I think Michael may have tried to describe this, paint a word picture of this graph. <laughs> well, it's not that difficult, it just does this. It's in, th so this is a graph of the bytes per month that we accept and transfer on ESNet on a logarithmic scale. So um, this looks like a nice flat line, but actually if gra graphed linearly, it would be um, a staggeringly steep curve. What's interesting about this is that the data goes back to 1990. So during the dot-com boom, during the dot-com bust, during the rise of the World Wide Web, the um, overall rate, you know, it changed a little bit. And, and when the LHC kicked on, we it was perturbed a little bit. But this is roughly a Moore's Law curve. And the underlying drivers for this I don't see actually changing. I think we can safely project this trend out into the future. So we accepted 14 petabytes in January. Um, that number doubles every 18 months and goes up by a factor of 10 every 48 months. And um, Engineering to accommodate that is very, very challenging. It's the primary dynamic of our work as engineers, I would say. This growth is about twice the rate of growth of the commercial internet, which is notoriously hard to measure and get good data on. But actually, we had a meeting of um, CTOs at LBNL last week, and from a major provider, we heard what I've read as well, that the growth rate of the commercial internet, even despite the explosion of video, is around 30 to 40 percent. Our growth rate is around 72 percent a year. And you've, you, I think you've all heard about big data. You've heard about the drivers for big data. We may all have a bit of big data fatigue, um, although um, I, I will say it's not going away. <laughs> this, this, I, I believe this graph, we're, we're going to be living in this world for a decade. I don't think exponentials in a human context can have uh, ever continue forever, right? They always, they always, um, the slope goes down at some point, but I just, I think we're going to be living in the world of big data for 10 years or so. And I wanted to tell you about a driver for us that you may not have heard about. Um, you've heard about genomics probably, and you may have heard about um, data related to astronomy. The, the, one of the most um, interesting drivers for us is the explosion of data at light sources. So these intense and, um, sources of, of um, X-ray light in the hard or soft X-ray regime that are scattered all around the country. Um, these are essentially big circular racetracks for photons, and um, periodically there's a sort of a tangent line to the circular racetrack with a scientific beam line. The photons are focused very sharply. They come off, and something 
you know, interesting happens on the beam line, like protein crystallography. Um, and on that beam line, they're essentially um, digital cameras, and they take they take pictures. And what's interesting about those cameras is that they um, they're growing in two dimensions at once, both on a Moore's law curve. So the resolution of the pixel detectors is going up on a Moore's law curve, but also the refresh rates for the cameras is going up. So as a result, we have a compounded Moore's law growth rate for the detectors. And we know from, from um, there's actually four of these next generation detectors going in at the advanced light source at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab on a beamline just like this. These are relatively small detectors. And instead of generating a few hundred megabits a second, they're each going to generate between 8 and 10 gigabits per second. Now, this is, um, this is happening on a small number of beamlines on one light source on, in one national lab. But in fact, there are 40 beamlines in the average light source. Maybe there's 80 in some. And there's dozens of light sources around the world. And so um, he, here's a. Um, explosive driver of traffic that you may not have heard about, but that we're thinking very actively about right now at ESNet. Um, one final thing to say about uh, the Energy Sciences Network, just in general, is that you may not, this may not be intuitively um, obvious. Most of our traffic leaves the DOE complex. Only about 20% um, of our traffic now stays on the DOE complex. The rest goes to um, university partners. So it goes via Scenic, it goes via Internet 2, or it goes to our European partners. And, and that's because, to a first order, the DOE labs produce data and they archive data, and, but DOE also funds researchers, 27,000 PhDs in, in, in all 50 states who want to consume that data. And lots of people that DOE doesn't fund want to consume that data. And you know, just in California, if we zoom in on a relevant part of that map, there are too many collaborations even to visualize on this slide. Dozens and dozens of researchers who are funded to um, do work at DOE Labs and consume the data. OK, so now, now on to this notion of the network as an instrument for discovery. Um, I think in the past, we have often described our network as an infrastructure, and um, we've when, de when describing it, we've usually used a map to explain what it is and what it does. Um, we thought about it sort of as a platform for service delivery, but as a, something kind of separate and somewhat invisible compared to the discovery processes that are happening on top of it. It's a little bit like um, the electrical grid, the old style electrical grid, not the newfangled smart grid. And this, by the way, is a map of our new 100 gigabit network, and the thick blue lines represent 100 gig paths. But um, in the last five years or so, I think th there have been three historical um, changes, inflection points in the history of research networks that call into question this model. The first one is just the fact that we now have abundant capacity. And I know many of you are network engineers, so you understand this intuitively. But for those who are not, I would just say, um, if you can think about a piano keyboard, which has 88 keys, the optical capacity that ESNet and, and Scenic shares in this optical capacity as well, and Internet2 has, um, for, for these 100 gigabit networks, which are large and, and can accommodate a great deal of, of data, um, each of those networks is like a single key on the keyboard. So right now on the optical network we share with Internet2, it's, it's like we have C and Internet2 has C sharp, but there's room for each of us to grow out to 43 more wavelengths. And that, that makes things possible that simply weren't before. And I'll talk a bit about, about what might be possible as a result. So that's one um, inflection point. Another is this um, amazing transition um, in, in status of the network from something that's sort of a black box, not capable of being inspected or programmed or virtualized, into something that's a lot more like a system that can be programmed, um, can be interacted with programmatically, can be reserved and virtualized. And you know, there's, you really have to sort of try to scrape away the hype from this conversation. Certainly, we're at the top of the Gartner hype curve around OpenFlow and software-defined networking. But at ESNet, we do firmly believe that this is important and transformative, and that especially as we build out our network to accommodate um, that growth the curve that I showed you, OpenFlow is going to be very important. Um, maybe other forms of software-defined networking as well, and helping us grow cost-effectively. So I think this is real, this paradigm sh shift of programmability. And finally, and maybe most, um, most exciting of all, actually, is that campus architectures are really bec becoming newly optimized for data mobility. And I've been in networking for a long time, and many of you have too, and you've probably heard 
ad nauseum about the end to end problem. The end to end problem is impossible to fix. It's, there's no one person who owns it, and we can't do anything productive in networking until the end to end problem is fixed. But the end to end problem is getting a lot better, and it's a combination of um, um, visionary NSF um, funding through the vehicle of the CCI and NIE awards, and I think a sort of a consensus architecture that's emerging um, around how to build campus networks so they're safe and secure but they also um, contain protected data enclaves for, um, that, are, that are science flow friendly. And more and more campuses are, are taking advantage of the CCNI grants. I know there's another round due in a couple of weeks. Um, I have strongly encouraged Kevin to just keep pouring money into these grants. I think that they're incredibly important and I hope he does uh, do that, Kevin Thompson at NSF. So all these changes lead me to th want to think about the network differently, to think of it really as an extension of the discovery instrument itself, not as an infrastructure, but as an extension of the instrument for discovery. Um, and this idea is not entirely new. I would say it's absolutely implicit in the architecture of the Large Hadron Collider and the way discovery works um, at CERN, the way the Higgs boson was discovered. Um, but more and more, um, more and more uh, large-scale collaborations, either um, ramping up right now or on the drawing board, um, make this kind of assumption about the network. And, and one great example is the square kilometer array. You, some of you may have been dazzled by what you've read about the square kilometer array. And if you haven't learned about it, I would encourage you to Google the phrase and learn a little bit about it. It's this massive, almost unthinkably large um, radio astronomy array that will span um, Southern Africa and Australia. The, da the raw data coming from the thousands of radio detectors spread across that vast area, the data rates will exceed by, by, many, by, many, by probably an order of magnitude the current total global capacity of the internet. So the data rates will be something like 10 million gigabit uh, channels. Of course, eventually they'll be reduced into something more like a you know a hundred gigabits that will that will need to travel transoceanically around the world. But um, at a recent Norgenet, the chief optical engineer for SKA just simply said that the um, the network is really at the heart of this instrument. And for for more and more large scale scientific um, collaborations, very large scale, order of one, two, three billion dollars, this is going to be true. You may be a little skeptical and think that the network really we shouldn't elevate ourselves so when the network really can't be um, an instrument for discovery. Naturally, we think about instruments a little differently. Um, this is the Atlas detector at CERN. It's a, it's a cathedral-sized, billion-dollar um, miracle of technology. It's one of the largest and most complex machines ever built. I think Lewis actually had the pleasure of seeing it before it was dropped into place. <laughs> I wish I had seen it. Um, it's, it's natural to think about discovery happening just inside that detector, but if you take a network-centric view of the LHC, and this, this little map comes courtesy of Bill Johnson, who's a colleague of mine at ESNet, and you, um, you think about um, the way networks and computation work in the discovery process, then the detector is just one part of what's happening. A petabyte a second comes out of the detectors. There's hardware triggers to reduce those um, signals down to something a little more manageable. Then there's an, a worldwide grid infrastructure of um, you know, scheduling software, um, data management software, and, and codes um, that are distributed because this is a nice, um, instead of calling it embarrassingly parallel, the new term is pleasingly parallel um, uh, problem. It can be, um, each, each event can be separated from others and can be analyzed separately, and so the events are kind of farmed out all around the world. Um, networks, um, the data rate to the, the tier one centers that get a copy of most events is something about 50 gigabit, gigabits a second. There is no discovery without the grid software, without the computation, the storage, and the networks. And so if you ask where does discovery occur in this kind of process, it's a little difficult to localize. Um, and where the instrument ends is a little difficult to say as well. And in fact, um, if you if you study the evolution of the way the LHC scientists have thought about the network and used it and looked at the way their data model has evolved over time, it's quite interesting. Originally, they used the, data, they used the network as a kind of Xerox machine for data sets. So they just made copies and they distributed copies around the world and there was a fairly strict hierarchy about who could access what, what copies and where. 
And, and the network was just sort of a fail-safe to distribute data and also functioned in a way as a, as a democratizer of the data because many nation states funded this $10 billion project and everyone wanted equal access to the data in, in approximately real time. So um, the network worked so well in this workflow that uh, quickly these hierarchies were relaxed a little bit and the collaborations began to rely on optimistic caching. So we don't necessarily have to have a copy of all the data. We'll just get the data we know we need. And if, if we need some data that's a little bit more uh, unusual from the perspective of our analysis workflows, we'll grab that when we need it. More recently, they moved into essentially a remote I.O. model. So it's, it's a model um, called the Federated Data Store model where um, just portions of relevant data sets are, are, are fetched. And you could fetch them from anywhere in the world, literally. That hierarchy has been almost entirely relaxed. And they're fetched just before they're needed. And this transition, which has already happened, it's, it's um, both CMS and Atlas are in this third mode right now, um, represents a greatly increased faith in global science networks. And in, in many ways, greatly increased efficiency for the overall workflow as well. And so we're, we're actually moving into a model where um, um, workflows are, are optimized in real time, where scientists and middleware, not, not the scientists, they shouldn't have to think about this, the middleware apps are thinking about questions like, do I have enough storage to bring um, this data set here locally, or should I move VMs associated with my computation out to where the data set exists? Should I store this data set all the time, or should I just bring parts of it when I have a calculation to do? And the programmability of networks will enable um, workflow engines that make those kinds of decisions and calculations to work in real time, to tell our networks, hey, set up a multi-domain path for a 10 gigabit flow from CERN to um, you know, UC Berkeley, um, UC Santa Cruz, um, for the next 10 minutes to make sure this workflow can complete on time. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about this model in California, just a few um, data points that I know about. I was able to read my email this morning and learned that, um, that the Cancer Genomics Hub at Santa Cruz won an important award, um, was awarded Scenic uh, Innovations Networking Award for High Performance Research Applications. Um, and this is, seems like an exemplary instance of the network functioning as an instrument. And in fact, this collaboration is even built, as I learned at TIP, actually, in Hawaii a couple months ago, interesting user-facing tools to make data mobility easier. I think the tool is called GeneTorrent, and it sounded quite intriguing to me. So, so here's an example of a discovery process, an important one for our world, because cancer affects a third of all women and a half of all men uh, in, in the United States, um, relying utterly and entirely on ICT and on and high-speed networks. Here's another example you, you may not know about, but you, though you may remember from about a year and a half ago that scientists at UC Berkeley and an LBNL discovered the, uh, the youngest supernova ever to be discovered, um, or at least the youngest in, in 40 years or so, so the youngest since we've had good instruments to, to watch the explosion of a supernova. Um, supernovas are important because they tell us about the life cycle of stars, but also they help scientists measure um, the expansion of the universe, and in fact, it was supernova-based inquiry that led to the discovery of dark energy. Um, just a few years ago, Saul Perlmutter at LBNL was awarded the Nobel Prize for that discovery. So um, this actually made it into the news. It was on the McNeil era news hour. You could, have, you could see this supernova um, just in your backyard, so it was pretty interesting and pretty bright. Um, the workflow that, that um, discovered the supernova is very much a California workflow. So the data was taken at Palomar through a project called the Palomar Transient Factory. Um, because there's no fiber directly to the telescope, um, the data came down to San Diego over the, um, I think it's called HPRIN, the wireless network. And from there up um, via SDSC to ESNet to nurse the supercomputing center run by LBNL that's in Oakland. Um, and that's more or less in real time, so the, the um, pictures are taken. They're compared with pictures from the previous hour and previous day in real time by codes that implement some sort of machine learning algorithm and that are looking for new dots in the sky. If they can find them quickly, all the world's telescopes get trained on those new dots and um, an enormous amount of productive data can be gathered um, that will lead scientists uh, um, to discover, as they did in this case, lots more about the way supernovas work and the way stars are, are born and die. So what this looks like 
sort of apparently if, as an, if you're an outsider is that the internet just kind of works, right? So the data just takes the internet <laughs> from Palomar to Nurisk. But, but actually what happen, what's happening, and you can see, I've put a few elements of the architecture here, science DMZ um, designs, perf sonar systems, data transfer nodes. We'll talk about some of those elements, I will, a bit um, when I discuss science DMZ, um, are absolutely critical. And we have, a, um, we have a dedicated science optimized network that's quite complex that is essentially coupling these large scale instruments together over a third instrument, the network itself. Without the network and without the, um, and, and these, many of these elements in the network are not commercially available. And they're, they're elements that we designed, we, the r &E community, together implemented and maintain. Um, uh, so without, without the network, this discovery workflow doesn't work. Uh, here's another example from just a couple weeks ago. There's a really interesting new um, capability at Stanford in, the, uh, in Slack, the national lab there that's the, the linear accelerator. Um, it's been part of the Slack beamline has been repurposed into um, a, a very advanced free electron laser. So it's, it's a new kind of light source that can do things that other previous light sources couldn't do. And one of the things it can do is because it has such a short pulse period, it can actually image um, proteins and other structures before it, it can, it, the pulse is so short that we can image before the x-rays actually destroy the sample, which is a big problem with longer pulses. So with a 50 femtosecond, and that's pretty short pulse, um, we can discover um, a lot more about structures that we're just guessing about now. And this is an example of an experiment just performed a couple weeks ago to um, try to understand and document the structure of photosystem two, which arguably is the most important um, uh, protein structure in, uh, in the world because it's responsible for all photosynthesis and then for, you know, indirectly for all life on Earth. And it's also of great interest to energy scientists because if we understood it better, we might be able to develop artificial photosynthesis. We might be able to engineer plants that can produce biofuel directly. Um, there's lots of interesting implications of understanding it better. So this is one of, these new one of these new light sources, and I told you they have detectors that produce a lot of data. So the data coming out of this experiment for the two-week period when um, the beamline was acquired was something like 10 gigabits a second steady state. So um, if we overlay, this is the data that came out for the, f this is just for a few hours when the experiment, when the beamline was on, came out of Slack heading towards NERSC, and this is the same data overlaid on top of sort of the background radiation of traffic at NERSC, the supercomputing center. And you can see what's interesting about this to me is that here you've got one of the largest supercomputing centers in the world and a very data-centric supercomputing center that's constantly importing and exporting data. And yet this one experiment um, sort of blew everything else at NERSC out of the water. And increasingly, we're, we're not going to be just dealing with one of those. We're going to be dealing with um, dozens at a time, and this isn't going to be confined just to the national laboratory system. It's going to affect universities. Your university scientists are going to have beam time. The computational power actually back at NERSC that was processing this data in real time, and I don't think I said that, it needed to be processed in real time so that if um, the configuration of the experiment was, was, was bad in some way, it could be modified. This is only a few hundred cores, maybe 600 cores. So any of your campuses have access to six or 700 cores, and any of them could have researchers who get beam time at LCLS, at Slack, and you could be in this situation unexpectedly. You could get a call. Um, I have beam time in three weeks. It's a really critical experiment. Can you accommodate this 10 gig flow? I would expect that to happen more and more across the state. Here's a slide from Mike, Mike Norman from a conference that ESNet and Scenic helped organize a couple of weeks ago. Another coupling that's quite interesting between the supercomputer here, which is a really, uh, Gordon, a very interesting memory-rich supercomputer, and the new supercomputer being built at NERSC called Edison. Both center directors are quite interested in workflows that couple together the two computers. One is optimized for one kind of task the other for another. Um, and any data that needs to be shuttled back and forth between the two centers will naturally travel over ESNet and Scenic. So, so uh, why do we care very much about this distinction between infrastructure and instrument? I think it's a big deal. I think in the infrastructure view, we conceived our job as about moving bits, um, and we sort of thought of ourselves as offering IP dial tone. In the instrument view, 
Um, our job is, is, is about disk-to-disk -disk performance. It's about functionality. Um, it's about uh, adding value to a scientific process. Um, and, and I was chastened a little bit um, in our board meeting last year by Vint Cerf, who I showed you as one of our um, board members, to be very careful about using the word service in describing what we do as, as providers of networking. Service implies something that's um, um, a commodity, it's simple, easy, uh, easy for someone else to do. And increasingly, I use the word capabilities to describe what we do. It's quite different um, and what Scenic does too. We offer capabilities that are um, tailor, uh, that are, that are, that are uh, tailored for the needs of science workflows. Um, in the infrastructure view, I remember when I was a customer of ESNet, not the director of ESNet, and I wanted to get a uh, copy of the network topology, and that actually wasn't possible at that time. The net, uh, things have changed a lot since then, but I think this is not uncommon or hasn't been too uncommon among research networks. They're a little bit cautious about um, exposing utilization data and all kinds of data about the network. And this is true in Europe still. Um, in, in the instrument view, we want to make every aspect of the network visible. Not just visible, but capable of being queried through an API. So we're building open APIs, um, and we don't have the website for it yet, but we soon will have api.es.net. You as a researcher or consumer of any network-related information can, um, through a RESTful query, just grab data about real-time utilization, lots of other parameters on the network. Um, in, the in, in the infrastructure view, um, if a researcher comes and says, uh, how do you know what I need? The traditional answer has been, well, we can give you a gigabit, or we can give you 10 gigabit, or we can give you 100 megabit. Please choose one of those. And in the instrument view, um, it's a much more sophisticated sort of conversation. We work um, to understand the process of science. We work to document it, to, to produce a white paper, and then help, help um, the research teams in question project their needs for the next two years, five years and work to develop, as a last step, the, the, um, the network infrastructure topologies and capabilities that are needed to support these collaborations. But the first step is to listen and understand. I think the infrastructure view really limits us. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And, and um, it really takes focus away from what, what we do that's of differentiating value. We hire great people, creative people, people who, have, who are inspired by the sense of mission that we offer them. Um, we, we create constantly evolving architectures and capabilities. We constantly press on the bleeding edge of, of um, the state of the art and networking um, architecture. And we have ambition and audacity. We want to change the world. We know we work with scientists and researchers who want to change the world, and we want to help them do that and accelerate that. In the instrument view, we can, um, we can actually enable things that weren't possible before, like that coupling between Slack and NERSC or the coupling between Palomar and NERSC. Um, we, can, we can offer open APIs for discovery and inspection, and we can ultimately decouple data acquisition and storage and computation, making geography sort of irrelevant. And if I were to sum up actually what our vision is, ESNet's vision is, of what the world ought to be in 10 <laughs> years or so, it's a world where discovery is completely, completely unconstrained by geography. So the physical location of facilities and um, Computational centers and data and people just doesn't matter. Just as for you as a consumer, as a network engineer, this may matter to you, but as a consumer, you probably don't care where, where, uh, where www.newyorktimes.com is or where your Gmail is. Scientists shouldn't have to care about uh, data locality or instrument lo locality either. So we're trying to build a world in which science is totally unconstrained by geography. So uh, quickly, um, faster data for California. We are all in this together. Scenic and ESNet um, share the same fate, along with Internet2, all the regionals and the world's research networks worldwide. Um, if we can build a community knowledge base and, a, and um, practices that can accelerate data mobility around the world, we will succeed and we'll advance science and research. We have to do it together. Um, here are a few resources that I like to draw attention, draw people's attention to. One is fasterdata.es.net, which is, for us is our Bible. This is what, where we record everything we know about moving data fast. It's only a couple hundred web pages. It's not sprawling, but it, we update it every week or so. And we encourage you to read it, study it, and give us feedback, and help us make it better. 
Science DMZ, the concept is described there. I'm going to talk about that in a second as well. A lot of people have questions about security in the context of moving data flows very quickly. And, and as the average speed of the science data flow diverges steadily from the average speed of the sort of commodity video or email data flow, those questions are going to get more and more urgent. We've thought a lot about that. We have presentations on it. Um, and this is just one uh, recently from the Internet 2 conference, joint from the, from the TIP conference in January. Um, but we are eager to enter into conversation about security. Um, and then, of course, the CCNIE grants. I think you all know about them, but um, if you want to build a science DMZ on your campus, this is a source of funding. What we call science DMZ is, um, it's not a prescriptive design, it's really a design pattern. So it's a way of assembling common components that you already have probably, that you've thought about into um, a pattern that we know works, but it needs to be localized for your security environment and your, your uh, local technology environment. Um, a lot of the elements of this came from .edu, they came from Berkeley, they came from UCLA, campuses that have always run um, fast, big, open networks. We think there are three major um, elements to this. There's dedicated systems for moving data fast. These are tuned, typically Linux boxes. They've got sensible tools on them. We're not moving data using um, SCP, for instance. We've got clean uh, network architecture. Um, we don't have to optimize the whole campus architecture for massive data flows, but some corner of it we really ought to optimize and make sure we have a way of verifying that it's clean. And we do that verification with performance um, testing and measurement infrastructure. So those three things. If we can get those three things together into a campus border, we can actually enable that campus to play in this world. I'm not going to say much about DTN's data transfer nodes, but I did hear uh, at dinner last night that San Diego is building some really cool new flash-based um, DTNs. That's awesome. Um, we'd love to hear about how that goes and how fast they are and what you learn, and we'll put that information on the Faster Data website when we learn that. Um, uh, here's a tool we like. Some of you may know about Globus Online. For those of you that don't, it's sort of the aim of it is to bring the ease of, um, well, to bring the, the high performance of um, Grid FTP, which is a great but somewhat difficult and gnarly tool to learn to use with the ease of a kind of um, uh, cloud-based um, user experience like Amazon. We announced a partnership with Globus Online at Supercomputing in the fall, and we're working jointly to do a few things. We're trying to integrate tools like Globus into um, the network capabilities we offer, like, like um, Oscars, which is our tool for creating um, guaranteed bandwidth. So we're trying to get those um, technologies a little bit closer together, so if you use one, you have the option of using the other. Um, we're trying to, we will be doing outreach together to sort of evangelize um, the benefits of ultra high speed networking, especially to small and medium sized collaborations who have not realized those benefits yet. The high energy physics community, it's massive, it's thousands of people, billions of dollars, they've done this well. Small collaborations just haven't had the, the time and opportunity to do that. Um, we're together evangelizing Science DMZ as well, and we all both have an applied research program, and so we're going to be doing, you know, applied network research, especially in the area of integration. So we think Globus Online is great, and we like to uh, to tell the world about it. Here's a quick. Um, wonder what happened there. Wow. I've been Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> I really have. OK. Well, let me just, I'll try to reconnect. And if not, I'll just do what Michael did. It's always a good policy to do what Michael did. All right, let's see if I can try this one more time. There is a graph I want to show you, which is why I'm bothering to reconnect this. It's really better not to just describe it. Okay. It goes, it goes up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you in suspense about which direction. Okay, let's see if I can excuse this. Uh, too many slides. Sorry. This is a quick review. All right. So um, the point I wanted to make next about Science DMZ is that um, there's lots of ways to do it. 
Um, so I'm going to flash through a few drawings. Um, here's sort of Science DMZ classic. The idea is just to create a little part of your network that's dedicated for science data flow. Um, you can do that with virtual circuits. You can do it with OpenFlow. You can um, create Science DMZ as a service on your border so that different collaborations have different security controls and access a little bit different part of the Science DMZ. All these drawings with annotations of them and discussion of the advantages and disadvantages are on fasterdata.es.net. Um, the third component is performance monitoring infrastructure. This is really critically important. Those of you who've debugged problems in the interdomain case, you know, in different time zones, you know how horribly frustrating and difficult that can be. The antidote to that, we think, is Personar, which is a distributed performance monitoring and forensic analysis platform. Um, it helps us find and fix soft errors. It helps us establish the ground truth about what's possible and what's not. It, and it actually helps us raise expectations for networking generally by showing what's possible between point A and B um, so that you can fix the path between point B and C. Often just showing a graph um, has a powerful impact on network engineers who might be inclined to um, deny that there's anything wrong between the path between B and C. Um, if you're gathering performance information in real time as you go along 24 by 7, you, um, you will discover things that um, you couldn't have found otherwise. And the top um, slide, the top graph here, and there's two of them, shows um, a router that um, essentially I think moved probably into CPU forwarding mode because its route table became full and as soon as it was rebooted, um, the router, the throughput uh, across the router um, returned to normal without some sort of um, um, visualization tool for recording the before and the after, you get no sense of um, um, feedback um, connected with your debugging effort. So this is really critical operationally. Um, in, the, in the bottom example, um, here's something that happens from time to time. Um, an optical component will just sort of fail gradually. So the throughput, the two colors there, um, represent throughput in opposite directions across a router interface. And um, as one component died, um, the throughput died in that direction. Once it was replaced, the throughput was restored. Just having this stuff collected automatically and available so that engineers and customers and everyone can go online and look at the results is incredibly helpful. Um, we now deploy 80 Personar nodes across our network. There's 500 nodes deployed around the world. So this is really taking off. This used to be hard to get people to do it. It was hard to get networks and campuses to deploy Personar nodes, but now more and more of them popping up all over the time. So, uh, so many that it's actually sometimes difficult to visualize um, um, the complex set of, of um, performance characteristics that you might do between multiple sites. So we've developed a dashboard, which um, you can download and install on your own website. It's really simple. You can customize it for the endpoints that matter to you. Maybe if you can customize it for each collaboration that's um, data intensive, put it on your own website. It can consume your own personar data or others' data. And it's a nice way to, um, to let scientists and other collaborators, and researchers, um, uh, know about the health of a particular part of your network. Um, so finally, I just have a few more minutes here, and I want to talk about um, a couple of forward-looking initiatives at ESNet. Um, we recently went through the process of developing a 10-year strategic plan, and it forces you to develop slides like this with mission, um, over, you know, guiding vision and strategic goals. Um, it was actually a fairly useful exercise, but below the level of the strategic goals here are some initiatives that we'll, do, that we'll implement in the next um, couple of years, and we're start to, starting to implement now that I wanted to share with you. The first of these is to really greatly increase our effort in partnerships and science engagement. And um, we'll do that in two ways, in a sort of tactical way and then in a strategic way. Tactically, we think we need teams composed of domain scientists and network engineers and maybe systems people to jump on um, data mobility problems and to own them so that there's a single, you know, um, there's a single zone of responsibility for the problem, and the problem gets solved. In the DOE parlance, um, there's a, we call these tiger teams, and I don't know if that's the right name for these ultimately. We may call them faster data teams or something, but we're going to actually hire people to be on these teams and spin them up so that when we have a, a difficult problem, maybe an interdomain problem related to moving climate data, we can actually spin up a small project around fixing that. 
Now that's sort of tactical. It's kind of reactive in some ways. It doesn't scale all that well because you can't build a million of these. But one thing it does that's very powerful is to create examples. And examples are very persuasive, examples with graphs and narratives. And we will use those examples to, to make an impact in um, a little bit more systematically in the communities we want to influence. More strategically, we're going to be targeting these, the, the 30 user facilities I mentioned and, others, other, uh, in, and also facilities outside the DOE um, to um, uh, help them understand what they can expect from modern networks and to give them the tools and the, any um, education and training they need to take better advantage of networks. So that's, that's our um, increased effort to outreach and partnership. And this, the second thing I want to mention is um, um, more of an emphasis on tools development, real-time network discovery and correlation tools, scaling, scaling well beyond 100 gigs. We, we have built a nice tools team that has expertise both in visualization and data analytics. And right now, they're, um, the public face of what they do is on our user portal, my.es.net. But, uh, and that's pretty impressive. And also, the Viz widgets on that portal are also publicly available. You can use them in your own web websites. But what we think we can do with that team going forward is to do real-time analytics of interesting science flows. We can identify problems, network problems, in real time and try to diagnose them. Ultimately, we'd like to migrate some of the fast flows in real time to the optical layer. Or we may want to apply a security policy if something interesting is happening. We want, but but um, we know in order to do that, we've got to develop the ability to process packets in real time. Um, this is the graph I was referring to. This is just a projection of our traffic. Um, this is the whole historical traffic growth and the projection going forward for 10 years. We think that we will need to add another 100 gig network to the one we currently have sometime next year, maybe in mid-14. Um, we're going to need to replace router and optical chassis um, a couple years after that. And we'll be at, we believe we'll be at terabit. We won't have native terabit capability in 2017, but we'll have 10 by 10, 10 by 100, rather. And we think that our optical platform will be exhausted in 2020, and then we'll have quite a, quite a dilemma. Um, I don't, again, I don't know if this exponential will continue unabated, but I think it probably will. So final slide. Um, this is about us working together. It's about ESnet and Scenic collaborating, about the DOE and .edu collaborating. At ESnet, we, we are really mission focused. Um, sometimes I think it can appear to be a little um, naive <laughs> or, or peculiar if, if, if you're on the outside of the culture, but we are really, really focused on um, addressing and solving the most important problems, pressing problems in the world today, among them climate change, which I think should concern all of us. Um, we need you to help. We'd like to do this together. Um, we'd like to work more closely with Scenic and with staff throughout the UC system. And I will say, we're also hiring. We're looking always for network engineers, for systems engineers, software engineers, people at the top of their game technically, but more than that, people who are sort of virtuosos at collaborating, because we are a highly collaborative culture. And with that, I think I've used every minute of my time. I thank you for your attention. Take care. I'm happy to take a question if there are any. OK. I'll, with that, I'll get off the stage. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.